Nicodemus meets Jesus at night. One night, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a respected ruler of the Jews, approached Jesus under the cover of darkness. As a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, Nicodemus held a position of authority, yet something about Jesus' teachings and miraculous signs had stirred his heart. He came at night, possibly to avoid being seen, as a figure of his status seeking out this controversial teacher might have caused a stir among his peers. Nicodemus began respectfully, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. In this opening, Nicodemus recognized Jesus as a legitimate teacher, though he framed his statement cautiously. Addressing Jesus as Rabbi was significant. Nicodemus acknowledged Jesus as an equal, even though Nicodemus was well established within the religious elite. Scholars suggest that Nicodemus' use of we reflects that some among the Pharisees were intrigued by Jesus, though most remained skeptical. His reference to signs reflects a theme in John's Gospel where miracles point to Jesus' divine authority. But rather than acknowledging the compliment, Jesus cut straight to the heart of the matter. He replied, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was startled. Being born again was a concept entirely foreign to him. The phrase in Greek, geni the nothing, can also mean born from above. Scholars debate whether Nicodemus understood Jesus' words as referring to a second physical birth or misunderstood the spiritual dimension implied by from above. This ambiguity likely added to Nicodemus' confusion. How can a man be born when he is old? He asked. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus responded with further clarification. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The reference to being born of water and the Spirit has been widely interpreted by scholars as baptism, which by the time John's Gospel was written, had already become a central Christian rite. Water baptism was a symbol of repentance and purification, and the Spirit was the agent of spiritual transformation. Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus that entering the kingdom of God required more than physical birth or legalistic adherence to the law. It required spiritual rebirth, a transformation brought about by the Spirit, whose movements, like the wind, were mysterious yet undeniable. Still, Nicodemus struggled to grasp the meaning of Jesus' words. How can these things be? he asked. Jesus' reply was pointed. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? This question was a gentle rebuke. Nicodemus, a respected scholar of the scriptures, should have understood the concept of spiritual renewal. The Hebrew prophets, especially Ezekiel, had spoken of God's promise to give his people a new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27. Jesus was not introducing an entirely new idea but revealing the fulfillment of what the prophets had foretold. However, Nicodemus, like many of his contemporaries, had focused so much on the letter of the law that he missed the deeper, spiritual realities behind it. Jesus continued, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Here, Jesus was not only revealing the heavenly source of his knowledge but also his unique relationship to God. The title, Son of Man, alluded to the prophetic vision in Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14, where a figure with divine authority is given dominion over all nations. Jesus was emphasizing his heavenly origin and his authority to reveal divine truth. He then referred to a familiar event from Israel's history. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jefferson Jesus referenced Numbers 21 4-9, 
where Moses lifted up a bronze serpent to heal the Israelites bitten by poisonous snakes. In the same way, Jesus foretold his own crucifixion, where he would be lifted up on the cross for the salvation of those who believe. This pointed to the central theme of John's Gospel, belief in Jesus as the means to eternal life. Jesus' next words revealed the heart of his mission, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This verse, often regarded as the gospel in a nutshell, encapsulates the depth of God's love for humanity. Scholars note that the word for world, cosmos, here emphasizes the universal scope of God's love, not limited to Israel, but for all people. The giving of the Son referred to Jesus' impending death, a sacrificial act driven by divine love. Jesus added, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here, Jesus addressed a crucial misunderstanding. His mission was not one of condemnation but salvation. Yet, rejection of this offer of salvation would lead to self-condemnation. The imagery of light and darkness followed. This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Jesus was offering a profound insight into the human condition. The resistance to the light of truth stems from a desire to hide sin. Scholars have noted the connection to John's earlier portrayal of Jesus as the true light, John 1 verse 9, which the world either rejects or accepts. Those who embrace the light come into alignment with God's purposes, while those who reject it remain in spiritual darkness. Nicodemus, a learned teacher of Israel, had come seeking understanding, and though Jesus' words challenged him, they planted seeds of transformation. As he left that night, his mind swirled with the teachings he had just heard. Words about being born again, the Spirit, and the ultimate love of God that offered eternal life to all who would believe. Though Nicodemus didn't fully grasp it then, this encounter would lead him, in time, to take a more open stance toward Jesus, as later accounts in John's Gospel reveal.